Kingsman, The Secret Service, written by Mark Miller, art by Dave Gibbons. In this video, I will be breaking down the comic book story Kingsman, The Secret Service, which was written by Mark Miller and came out in 2012. This is a story that sort of plays with the James Bond 007 thing and does a really fun kind of twist on it. Now, you may be familiar with this franchise because there has already been two movies made on it. In 2014, there was The Secret Service, and in 2017, there was The Golden Circle. And honestly, I think the movies are really, really good. They are so Vaughn. Matthew Vaughn, he's a really good director. He really knows how to shoot action and do compelling stuff with it. So the movies have great action. They're really funny. I'm a big fan of the franchise, and uh, it's going to be really fun in this video to break down the comic book so you can see where that movie is taking the material from and see kind of the differences between the comic and the movie. I also found out there's even going to be a few more movies in the Kingsman universe. They're doing a prequel. They're doing a sequel. They're even doing a, a spinoff on the Statesmen, which was a group that was introduced in the second movie. So, so much more Kingsmen in the future. Now, the reason I am doing this video is because I was doing a poll on my channel over the last week or so, asking my viewers, what Mark Miller book do you want me to cover? And this is the result of that poll. So we see Kingsman Secret Service was the number one with 21% of the vote. So that is why I am doing this video. Number two was Superior, and I will try to get to that one next. After that, I might do Prodigy or I might jump around a bit. But I want to thank everyone that voted in that poll for uh, helping me sort of decide what books I should try and get to. All right. Let's dive into it, Kingsman, The Secret Service, and see how the comic compares to the movie. Issue 1 The story opens in Switzerland. We see a snowy cabin. Some terrorists have kidnapped Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill played Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars films, if for some reason you didn't know that. In the Kingsman movie, Mark Hamill actually played a small role as well sort of a nod to his appearance in the comic. Except in the movie, Mark Hamill was playing a different character altogether. Where in the comic, Mark Hamill is himself Mark Hamill. So Mark Hamill asks the terrorist what they want with him. Are they trying to raise a ransom? The terrorist answer that money is something they have plenty of. Just then though, one of the Kingsman Secret Service agents busts into the cabin to rescue Mark Hamill. The agent kills the terrorist by shooting them with all precise, clean headshots. The agent then introduces himself to Mark Hamill, and the two of them run outside of the cabin to a nearby snowmobile waiting to take them away. As the agent and Mark Hamill arrive on the snowmobile and begin driving, they get pursued by tons of other terrorists with skis and guns echoing something that often happens in James Bond movies where the bad guys are on skis with their rifles. There is a line connected between two trees and it decapitates many of the skiing pursuers. The snowmobile also has some bombs it releases out its back that explodes and kills more of the terrorist pursuers. The secret agent and Mark Hamill, they then drive off a cliff the Secret Service agent tells a scared Mark Hamill, Don't worry, the parachute can hold both of us. Problem is though, something was wrong with the parachute and it got stuck. And Mark Hamill and that Secret Service agent both die as the snowmobile crashes directly onto the ground. And then as Mark Hamill and the agent are now dead, and their snowmobile is destroyed, then the parachute decides to pop open when it no longer matters. The terrorists, seeing the aftermath of this, talk amongst themselves and they say that Dr. Arnold is going to be very pissed off about losing Mark Hamill. Now, Dr. James Arnold is the big bad villain in Volume 1. He is very smart, very wealthy, he is a cell phone entrepreneur. He has developed a plan to fight global warming 
which involves solving the Earth's overpopulation problem. He plans on killing billions of people. This way, the humans that are left can live on. And because there will be significantly less humans, the carbon footprint will be more manageable, and the world will be saved. In the movie, this character of Dr. James Arnold was called Valentine and was played by Samuel Jackson. Their characterizations are very similar, except the comic book version is a little bit more nerdy and a little bit more of a loser and obsessed with various celebrities. So why does this James Arnold want to kidnap celebrities like Mark Hamill? Well, he is a nerd, and he wants to save his pop culture heroes from their deaths, for when he finally does his plan to kill off a large portion of the world. Right now, Dr. James Arnold is just in the planning phase, the testing phase, and he is starting to kidnap and collect these various celebrities, but most of the world has no idea what he is up to. We jump over to the south of London. We are introduced to our main character, Gary Unwin, better known by his nickname, Eggsy. In the movie, Eggsy was played by Taryn Egerton. So this Gary, or Eggsy, lives in a shitty, poor area of town with his mother, Sharon, his little brother, Ryan, and his mother's abusive boyfriend, Dean. Gary, he can't believe how white trash his whole family is, and how his mother puts up with the abuse from Dean. Although Sharon, she doesn't have the money to go elsewhere. Gary is disappointed how they are creating a bad environment for his little brother Ryan, as all of Dean's friends are always around, and they even have Ryan doing things like rolling joints for them. Gary, he leaves in disgust for the night to go hang out with his friends. Gary and his friends, they go driving, and a cop tries to pull them over for speeding. Gary, ever the troublemaker though, decides to try and speed away from the cops. Gary, he's a pretty good driver and he was succeeding on evading them, but then he had to swerve at the last minute to avoid running over a dog. And Gary, he crashed into a pole, and the cops came and arrested him. Over at Westminster, London, two Kingsman agents are talking. One is a man named Jack London. In the movie, Jack London is the equivalent of the character Harry Hart, or Galahad, that was played by actor Colin Firth. Jack London is talking to a man named Sir Giles. In the movie, Sir Giles would roughly be the equivalent of the character Merlin, which was played by actor Mark Strong. So Jack London and Sir Giles are talking about a case their agency is involved in. They are discussing what happened in Switzerland, how Mark Hamill and one of their own agents got killed. They also discuss all the recent celebrity kidnappings happening all over the world. There's been six cast and crew from the Star Wars films that have been kidnapped and gone missing, four from Doctor Who, eight from Battlestar Galactica, and five from Star Trek. Why would someone be abducting all of these celebrities, they wonder? Now while they are talking, Jack London gets a text from Gary's mom, Sharon, saying that her son Gary is in trouble and if Jack can help. Jack tells Sir Giles that he has a family emergency he has to attend to, and he has to leave. Now Jack London is the uncle of Gary. It is not established if Jack was the brother of Sharon or whomever Sharon's previous husband was, who was Gary's dad. But either way, Jack considers Sharon and Gary his family, and he helps them out from time to time. He's not super close with them, but he might see them once or twice a year on Christmas or something. Now in the movie, Harry Hart was not a direct family member to Gary, but rather owed his life to Gary's dad, who sacrificed himself on a mission in the Middle East to save Harry from an explosion. And because of that sacrifice, Harry gave Gary and Gary's mom a favor that they could cash in at some point in the future. So, 
we see some slight differences here between the comic and the movie, but it still follows the same general trajectory of the plot. In the comic, we don't really learn that much about Gary's dad. He is just out of the picture, and we don't know if he is alive or dead or what his deal was. So Jack London, he shows up outside of the police station to meet Sharon. Now Jack is not pleased with how Sharon is living her life, hanging out and dating losers like Dean, and how she is not providing a good life for Gary or Ryan and not raising them properly. She says that she is raising Gary to be a troublemaker. Sharon does not know that Jack is this secret agent. She just thinks that Jack works in computers with the fraud squad. But she knows that Jack has some sort of sway and may be able to help her son get out of jail. So they go inside the police station to see Gary. Jack, because he is a secret agent, he has a special card, a license card, that he can show the police. Almost like a get out of jail free card. And he can use it to get Gary out of trouble. Sharon and Jack argue about her parenting skills. But then eventually, Sharon breaks down crying and says, Just use your bloody card. And Jack answers, why? So he, he can do it all over again? I'm sick of my fraud office pass getting abused. It's time Gary got his act together and started taking some responsibility for himself. And Sharon replies, oh, that's perfect. Just have him thrown in jail. You see him once a year and you don't even care if he goes to prison. That's just typical of you, Jack. Jack tells her, all right. This is the last time, though, and he manages to pull some strings and get Gary out of jail and out of trouble. Jack, he follows Sharon and Gary back to their home in the rough part of the city, and Jack sees Sharon return to her abusive boyfriend, Dean, and he sees Gary return to his friends in the street, and they all toss some drinks back, and Jack, he does not approve. Jack, who normally wasn't involved that much in Sharon and Gary's life, decided to be a little bit more involved this time. He's going to see if he can give Gary an opportunity to improve his life. Issue 2 The main villain, Dr. James Arnold, he plans to use a satellite signal which would then send forth some sort of neurological wave and it would affect humans and make them go crazy and kill each other. Arnold plans to make the poor of humanity slaughter each other in order to solve the overpopulation problem. This is his plan in how he is going to wipe out most of the world. But before he can go global with this, he needs to do a trial run first, a test run. And he will do that in Hawaii right now. In Hawaii, there is some sort of group wedding happening. Tons of brides and grooms are about to tie the knot all together as one big collective. Arnold is watching from the ocean aboard his yacht, surveying various security cameras that are filming the wedding. Arnold is sitting alongside his trophy girlfriend, Ambrosia. The test commences. We see the priest at the group wedding tells the various brides and grooms, And so, by the powers invested in me by God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you man and wife. The satellite signal now focuses on this group wedding and sends forth the neurological wave that will affect them all. And like a switch, they all just flip. The priest, he continues, I now pronounce you man and wife, all 51 of you dear couples. Gentlemen, you may now kill the brides. And then it is just anarchy. The grooms are punching the brides, but the brides are also getting some action in and they are stabbing the grooms. It is insanity, it is gory, and there is tons of killing. The scene in the movie went down slightly differently than this. But I have to say, it was really cool and very well done in the movie. 
So everyone at this group wedding is just killing each other. Dr. James Arnold, watching on the security cameras, is pleased that his death satellite neurological wave thing is working. Everything went exactly according to plan. Although Arnold still feels a little bit bad. They are human beings after all. He says, that's enough, turn it off. And when he turns off the neurological wave, there is one bride still alive. She is standing there, her wedding dress covered in blood, and she snaps out of it. And she has control of her mind and body again and, and is no longer insane. And she sees that all the dead bodies around her and she says, Oh Jesus, what have I done? Arnold, he then has one of his men with a sniper rifle surveying the carnage shoot that remaining bride, as well as maybe any other stragglers that might still be alive. Back over to London. Gary with his Uncle Jack are at a bar. Jack tells his nephew that he is a secret agent working for the government. He has a license to kill and has killed many times. He is essentially James Bond. Gary can't believe this. He asks his uncle, I thought you were a computer guy working for the fraud squad? And Jack says that that is just a cover story. He got recruited out of school and worked his way up, and now he is the highest ranking field officer still in active service. Jack shows Gary his security card, and Jack explains, This is the card I always use to get you out of trouble. It also gets me into any building, starts any car, and can be used to commandeer a commercial airliner. I'm a spy, Gary. A super spy. And I want you to become one, too. Jack, he called in some favors, and they are willing to give Gary a shot in their training program. Gary, he doesn't think he's cut out for it, though. He says that he can barely get through school. Jack, though, he thinks that Gary is one of the most instinctually intelligent people that he knows. And he thinks that Gary is wasting his life right now and is capable of so much more. Just at that moment, some drunks in the bar start a fight with Jack. They call him a queer. Jack, he warns them to go back and sit down. When they refuse, Jack, he beats them all up, tearing up the bar breaking their teeth and smashing their faces into the counter, etc. The adaptation of this scene in the movie was also very awesome and very well done, I must say. The movie really expanded this fight and brought a lot more visual flourish to the scene and made it super memorable. In the comic, this fight scene lasts just about one page or so, so it's not as memorable. Jack and Gary, they leave the bar. And Jack tells Gary to think on it and make his decision by tomorrow. If Gary agrees, then Gary can enter into the training program. Gary goes home and tells his mom that he might be starting a new job in computers with his Uncle Jack. It would require him to live away full time for a while though. Gary, he then returns to his bedroom and contemplates if he really wants to do this. Jack is walking the streets of London, and he gets a phone call from other secret agent, Sir Giles, and they talk to each other through these fancy electronic sunglasses. These high-tech glasses were also something that was adapted in the movie. Sir Giles tells Jack about the killing spree in Hawaii, and he says that it might be connected to all the celebrity kidnappings that have been happening lately. And he wants Jack to go to China as there might be a possible connection there to investigate. Jack says he will. He wants to know though if there's time for him to get his nephew into the training camp before he heads off though. Sir Giles has looked over Gary's record. He doesn't think that Gary sounds like a good candidate, but Jack and Gary had similar upbringings and Jack says that he has an eye for talent and he thinks his nephew will succeed. Sir Giles, 
He welcomes Gary into the program and he tells Jack, well, it's your reputation on the line. The next day, Gary says goodbye to his mother and little brother, as well as to his asshole stepdad, Dean, and he leaves home. Jack, he drives Gary to the training camp. Gary expresses his wishes to make some money and move his mom and brother out of that shithole they are staying in so they can live somewhere nice for a change and get away from people like Dean. Jack says, good. There's nothing like a little motivation to help you through this. They pull into the training camp and Gary is very impressed by it. Gary is introduced to his training officer, a man named Rupert Greaves. While not exactly the same character, in the movie this Rupert Greaves would be close to the character of Chester King, aka Arthur, that was played by Michael Caine in the movie. Jack and Rupert to give Gary a tour of the facility. Gary, seeing all of the various guns, is pretty familiar with them. He recognizes a lot of them from playing video games like Medal of Honor. Gary, he sees all the other guns and explosives and gadgets and jetpacks and fancy cars and other tech being worked on here, and he can't wait to play with it all. Jack tells his nephew, This is your home for the next three years, Gary. It's not like a film or television show where someone gets drafted and immediately knows everything. We're going to teach you how to shoot properly, how to fly planes, how to do stunts in any kind of car, and bring a woman to orgasm every time. Rupert interjects and adds, Every bugger thinks they're good and bad, but we're going to spend the next six months covering the second G-spot alone. They continue on and tell Gary that he's going to learn medicine, physics, ballistics, linguistics, kung fu, botany, fencing, boxing, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be 36 months of agony. But he'll be everything he ever dreamed of by the end of it. So they ask him, are you ready, Gary, to take this on? And Gary answers that he is in. The next day, Gary's training begins. It seems kind of unorthodox. Gary has to beg in the street like a bum and get a thousand pounds. One of the most important skills a spy can have, apparently, is the art of gentle persuasion and Gary's ability to adapt to a hostile urban environment. So that is what begging will teach him. And next week, they're going to be moving on to street entertainment, and Gary is going to have to learn how to mime. Elsewhere in Beijing, China, Jack London is on his mission to investigate if China is involved in the celebrity kidnappings going on. Jack has broken into a government building, and he is on a computer looking up information. Some Chinese soldiers arrive, and they start yelling at him in Chinese to freeze and stop what he's doing. Jack, though, very coolly, he just raises his finger to his lips and tells them all to, shh, just give me two more seconds here. He needs to finish what he's doing. And we see 11 soldiers are pointing guns at him, while Jack continues just typing away. Issue 3 The Chinese soldiers are pointing their guns at Jack, and Jack he raises his hands, and his suit releases some sort of gas, and the gas disorients the rest of the soldiers around him. Jack then begins running and fighting his way through the soldiers. He then releases a device that creates many quakes for five seconds. Jack, he then uses his watch to call for his car, which I didn't get this part, which is somehow already inside the skyscraper with him. Anyway, Jack, he grabs onto the back of his car, which has special handholds for him. And then he remotely somehow drives the car out the window of the building. Jack, he then voice activates special wings on the car to pop out, and he is able to fly the car back down safely to the street below and get away. Elsewhere, Sir Giles and Rupert Greaves are discussing developments. 
Jack's work in China showed that China was not responsible for the celebrity kidnappings going on. And the Chinese are as clueless as the British are in the matter. Meanwhile, more writers, movie stars, technologists, and other celebrities have been kidnapped. And they are no closer into figuring out the who or the why. They then discuss how good Jack's nephew Gary is doing in his training so far. They say that Gary's observational skills are top-notch, the highest uh, they've ever recorded. Gary, he will see someone on the street in the morning, and later on in the day be able to report back exactly how they looked and what they were wearing. In the surveillance test, Gary surpassed all the other classmates. He brought back footage of two very famous Scientologists behind closed doors engaged in a sex act. In the Grand Theft Auto test, Gary excelled there as well, easily stealing a pretty high-profile car. Gary's fighting and street skills are also very good. However, intellectually, Gary is below the other students. He grew up in the poor area of town and he is not very sophisticated. He has no real knowledge beyond video games and reality television. Sir Giles comments that Jack was the same way when he was younger, but they were still able to mold Jack into something brilliant. Perhaps they can do the same with Gary. They want to see how Gary does in the assassination test. Murdering a total stranger always shows what a recruit is really made of. So we see Gary now on his assassination test with another recruit named Hugo. Hugo and Gary approach a gang of drug dealers. The two of them are supposed to murder these drug dealers as part of their training. The police have been told not to respond to any emergency calls in the area for a while. So Gary and Hugo confront the drug dealers. Gary, he's nervous, but Hugo tells Gary to shut up. Hugo eventually opens fire on the drug dealers and he kills one of them. But then, Hugo gets shot in his chest and falls down, and Gary is forced to defend himself and kill the rest of them. Gary, he manages to shoot and kill the rest of the drug dealers cleanly. The Kingsman trainers that have been surveying this all, they are impressed with Gary's abilities. The recruit Gary was with though, Hugo, is badly injured and might bleed out and die, but Gary he managed to act quickly and save this Hugo's life and bring him somewhere to get patched up. The next night comes a test to see how good the various recruits are at persuasion. They all essentially have to go into this posh nightclub and try to do well with some ladies, all while being monitored by their Kingsman instructors. All the other recruits are dressed nicely wearing dress shirts and blazers, but Gary, who comes from a lower class upbringing, has a different idea of dressing nicely. He is dressed in sweatpants, a baggy jacket with some fur, a baseball cap, and some chains. The other recruits look down on him, but Gary feels confident. They all head into the club. The object of tonight's exercise is to see how far they can get with these ladies before midnight. Dancing is one point, them buying you a drink is two, an open mouth kissing is three, and a home run, which is sex, is ten points. All the recruits hit the club floor, and they are all acting like they had some sort of lessons in dumb pickup artist tricks like negging the girls and wrapping up a compliment with an insult, etc, etc. Gary, he watches one recruit talking to two ladies, and the recruit says to the girls, Hey, are you girls good drivers? My friend and I are robbing a bank tonight and our real man didn't show up. And the girl responds flirtatiously, Oh, really? Well, I've got a motorbike if that's any use. Gary, baffled watching this success, comments to himself, That doesn't make any sense. Gary, he tries himself to do the old compliment wrapped in an insult trick. So he goes up to some ladies and says, all right, ladies, you might not be the best looking girls in here, but I don't mind screwing you with the lights out. What do you say? 
the girls are not impressed. They say, oh my god, get this guy away from me. And they walk away. Gary, he tries to chat with another group of girls and he quickly gets rejected there as well. Gary, he's feeling a little defeated. He wants to drink some alcohol to loosen himself up. But he is not over 21 years old and they won't serve him. Gary, he then overhears the other recruits who have all more privileged upbringings than him start talking about Gary behind his back. They say that Gary is over his head and he is making a fool of himself. Yeah, Gary's amazing and all of that Call of Duty stuff, but he's kinda dumb. He got Barack Obama and Osama Bin Laden confused this afternoon. Another recruit says, absolutely. It's not his fault, though. He just hasn't had the opportunities that we've had. But there's a reason it's hard to get into this spy game, and I don't want to see him getting into trouble. I'm worried that he gets hurt or someone else hurt. He simply doesn't belong in this line of work. Another recruit says, Nice work, guys. You had your radio pens switched down. All of the recruits had these little pens that they could communicate with each other. And they all had it on right now, so Gary was overhearing all of this conversation. One of the other recruits says, Oh Christ, do you think he hurt us? They didn't mean to hurt his feelings. They didn't mean to upset Gary, but they did. Gary, he was upset, and he stormed out of the club, and he decided to act out. Gary stole his uncle's fancy spy sports car and drove back to his home turf where all of his friends from back home live. And Gary, in the fancy sports car, asks his friends if anyone wants to go out on a joy ride. Issue 4 Gary, during his joyride with his uncle's sports car, wanted to impress his friends by pressing some of the spy buttons in the car. He wanted to, you know, squirt some oil on the road. But he accidentally ended up firing some of the missiles out of the back of the car. And the missiles exploded all over the street. Luckily, no one died, but it caused lots of property damage. And the police came, and Jack arrived, and Gary got in trouble. Jack, he brought Gary back to his apartment and gave him a talking to. Gary explains why he was acting out. He says, The other recruits made fun of me and they laughed at me. They laughed at my accent, my clothes, the way I look. Gary says he doesn't want to go back to the training and just get made fun of for being poor. Jack, trying to motivate Gary, shows him the pictures up on his wall in his apartment. All these pictures are the front page headline of the newspaper on the days that Jack saved the world. And all of the headlines are not about Jack saving the world, though. They are about things like David Beckham and other celebrity gossip. Jack explains, That's because... Everything I've done for the last 20 years has been so classified that even the Prime Minister only hears what we think he can handle. None of my jobs can ever be reported, so I frame what they do print in the next day's papers just as a little souvenir to myself. And Gary asks, doesn't that make you mad, people not knowing what you've done? And Jack answers, no, because fame and fortune don't make you happy, Gary. I've guarded enough celebrities to know how miserable they really are. All I make is a decent wage, and they give me the flat and a fancy car, but being in magazines or TV talent shows shouldn't be the limit of our aspirations. That's what you guys need to understand. Helping other people is the only thing that matters. Public service is what gives a man real value. And Jack asks Gary, if he would like to come back, but maybe if he made Gary his apprentice instead of just being a trainee? Jack says, what if I taught you how to blend in? Where to buy your clothes? What wine goes good with what food? Where to get your hair cut? I forgot what it was like and I'm so, so sorry, Gary, but if you let me make it up to you, I promise you won't regret it. Gary, thinking on it, answers, why not? I got nothing else going on, I suppose. 
Jack has to make Gary, though, do one final test before he can officially become his apprentice. Jack, he tells Gary, good boy, and then he sprays Gary with something that knocks Gary out. When Gary wakes up, it is 12 hours later, and he is in Columbia wearing nothing but his underwear. He does have a little radio piece in his ear, though, and through the radio piece, Jack is talking to Gary and tells him, This is a resource test, Gary, and if you fail to touch English soil inside 24 hours, you're out of the game. Do you understand the rules? Gary is confused. He asks his uncle, I thought you wanted me back. And Jack answers, I do, but Deputy Training Officer Quinn here needed a little more persuasion. That's why we've bumped you six months ahead in your training and are giving you the end of term final exam right now. You need to impress her to stay on the books after that little stunt you pulled stealing my car and the 200 grand in property damage you caused. Gary asks, but how do I get a flight back home to London without any money? When what's this thing on my wrist? And Jack answers, that's the address where you'll find your passport and a first class ticket to London tucked under the mattress in the master bedroom. But you need to get there as soon as possible, Gary. Your flight leaves at midnight and is a non-refundable. Now I wouldn't waste time standing around in your underwear because the local police can be pretty brutal down there. Sometimes I think they just look for an excuse to beat up random British tourists. So Gary, he gets to work. He punches out a cop and steals the cop's police car and throws the police officer in the back. Gary, he's gonna need transport and clothes, so now he has that taken care of. Gary then drives to the mansion where his passport and flight ticket is supposedly at in the master bedroom under the pillow. But it turns out that the mansion is the home of a very famous drug dealer. The drug dealers do not take kindly to Gary driving up on their property in a police car. So they begin shooting at Gary in the cop car. Gary, he backs out of the driveway and regroups. He grabs some machine guns that are in the trunk of the police car and Gary then returns to the mansion and guns all the drug dealers down, killing everyone except for the main drug kingpin. Jack and the other training officers are waiting in London to see if Gary can make it in time and pass his test. Things are not looking so good though. Gary did not get on the flight that they bought for him, but Jack, he believes in his nephew. And just at that moment, we see that Gary, he arrives in London on a private plane. And he meets his uncle on the airport tarmac, along with the other training officers. And Gary, rather than using his passport and the flight they bought for him, he stole the drug kingpin's private plane and flew himself back to London. And Gary even brought the drug kingpin with him himself as a present for the Kingsman Agency to give to the FBI. Jack is impressed. Gary has passed the test. And now that he has passed the test, he can now officially be an apprentice to Jack. Jack, congratulating his nephew, tells him that it's time to get him cleaned up. Jack basically pretty woman's Gary up, <laughs> gets him some fancy clothes, a new haircut, and by the time they are done, Gary is looking like a brand new man, all suave, wearing a suit. He looks like he could be James Bond himself. Several days or weeks later, Jack gets an update on all of these celebrity kidnappings happening. The Kingsman Secret Service agents have an idea who is behind it all. There are many rich lunatics who could afford this kind of thing, but only one with such a specific range of interests. Sir Giles explains that from Mark Hamill to Ken Robinson, Tony Robbins, Simon Sinek, Rowdy Roddy Piper, to 11 former animators at Hanna-Barbera, we accessed Google's database 
And this range of specific searches had a unique fingerprint to one specific person. And that man is Dr. James Arnold. So by violating everyone's privacy by using Google data, <laughs> they have figured out that this James Arnold is the man responsible because he's Google searched all these people. He's the one in the world most obsessed with it that would have the financial power to be able to pull it off. Jack asks Sir Giles, who is he? And Sir Giles explains he is a cell phone entrepreneur and the 127th richest man on the planet. We have no idea what he's doing with all of these celebrities though, but that is your job to find out. Dr. James Arnold is having a big party in France this week for his 23rd birthday, and I want you to infiltrate and find out what's going on. Jack says of course, and he's planning on bringing Gary with him on this mission. We jump over to Gary, so while Jack was getting briefed, Gary returned home to check in with his mom. Gary, he's now walking his local neighborhood with pride. He's a success, he's dressed well. When he returns home, he sees that his home is a mess and his mom has been hit again by her abusive boyfriend, Dean. Gary, in anger seeing the effect that Dean had on his mom, goes down to the local pub to confront Dean once and for all. As Gary approaches Dean with a look of hate and determination on his face, Dean fails to be intimidated. He says to Gary, Oh, I'm supposed to be scared because you're wearing a suit, eh? Does that mean you're a big man now? Or are you little prick? Come and show us what you learned. Come and teach Nolly Dean a lesson, eh? Gary smiles and gets ready to give Dean the beating that he deserves. Issue 5 Gary fights his stepdad, Dean. He kicks Dean in through the bar's doors, and then he stomps and kicks him some more. Dean is bloodied and beaten. And Dean's friends, they come to his defense, though. They usher all the other patrons out of the bar, and they lock the door. And they want to teach Gary a lesson. Gary, though, he has a special device called a neural disruptor. And he places this neural disruptor on the pool table in the bar. The device, apparently, mimics the effects of a minor stroke and impairs almost every message someone's brain can try to send to one's arms or legs. The effects are temporary, only last about three minutes, but that is all the time Gary will need. So Gary triggers the device and all of Dean's friends are incapacitated, but not Gary. Gary, he grabs a pool cue and he goes to town, whacking it over the heads of the others and taking them all down. And then Dean is left on the floor, and he is begging Gary now for mercy. And Gary tells him, Now listen to me, you lowlife scum, because I'm only going to say this once. If you or any of your friends even look at my mom again, I'll come back here and murder each and every one of you. You understand? I've got a license here that means I can't get arrested, and I will take tremendous pleasure in putting a bullet in your head. Gary then heads outside the bar and a police officer is there and asks him what's going on. But Gary just flashes his special license and says, Special Agent Status Constable, provisional license, but it's still perfectly valid. And the police officer has no choice but to let Gary go. Gary then returns home and moves his mom and his little brother into a new flat in the better part of town. Gary and his uncle paid for this new flat, and they are going to be giving Sharon and little Ryan money every month to help pay for various bills. Jack says he wishes he did this years ago for her. Gary and Jack then leave, with all the troubles at home now taken care of. They can focus on saving the world and continue investigating this Dr. James Arnold. We see you over in France. Dr. James Arnold is making some preparations. He is one day away from flipping the switch that will wipe out most of the world. 
he's talking with one of his henchmen, a black man named Gazelle. One thing about Gazelle that is pretty cool is that he has these metal blade legs that he walks on which are pretty badass. In the movie, I feel they kind of made this even a little bit cooler because they gender swapped the character to this sexy badass female assassin woman played by actress Sophia Butella and they really made her use her legs as weapons even more than the comic does so it was pretty cool seeing her slice up people with her legs almost like their sword legs anyway dr james arnold is going to have a lunch meeting soon with his favorite director of all time ridley scott the director of such films such as alien blade runner gladiator etc arnold is hoping to save ridley scott from the armageddon that is going to be taking over the world soon when he wipes out most of the world's population Arnold hopes that if he explains his genocidal plans to Ridley, Ridley will go along with it and appreciate the logic and gladly accept being saved by Arnold. If they fail to convince him though, Arnold tells Gazelle they're to knock Ridley Scott out and kidnap him and not give him a choice. Arnold then talks about his girlfriend Ambrosia, and she apparently is going to take one last look at all of the designer stores around before he eventually flips the switch tomorrow. So she won't be joining Arnold on his lunch meeting with Ridley Scott. Arnold tells Gazelle to have Ambrosia watched by his security people though. Gary and Jack London arrive in France. They know about the Ridley Scott meeting happening soon. For now though, they are trailing Arnold's girlfriend Ambrosia while she is shopping. They believe Ambrosia to be their way in to get Arnold. Jack says that they need to seduce her to get information. Jack tells Gary, Wives and girlfriends are always the key, Gary. Every mission I've ever worked on. This is where your seduction training comes in handy, because megalomaniacs are never very good in bed. They also tend to be workaholics, so the women in their lives are always very lonely and often just looking for a shoulder to cry on. They tend to be a lot more normal than the men and almost seem relieved for a chance to mess up their boyfriend's crazy plans. All they wanted was a glamorous lifestyle. They didn't want to see New York destroyed by a laser beam. Gary thinks that he will have a better shot seducing Ambrosia than his uncle. He's closer in age to her. But even though Jack is twice Ambrosia's age, he says confidently that he has this. He's a more experienced lover than Gary. He wants Gary to monitor the lunch meeting with Ridley Scott and see if he can learn anything there. They're both going to be wearing their spy glasses so that they can monitor how the, each other is doing on their respective missions. So Jack, he leaves Gary. He walks over and introduces himself to Ambrosia. And before you know it, he's back at his hotel and he is having sex with her and he gave her multiple orgasms. Afterwards, Ambrosia in bed tells Jack all about her boyfriend's evil scheme and how he's going to try and wipe out 5 billion people on the world tomorrow night. She explains her boyfriend's logic, how he's trying to solve the world's environmental problems, she says. It's just a moral choice for him in a weird kind of way. Does the planet wipe us out in 50 years time or does he save a billion lives by biting the bullet now? Jack asks her how is he planning on doing it and Ambrosia explains through cell phones. He made his fortune in telecommunications. His plan is really very simple. He's gonna change the frequency of the radio waves that are passing through us every day. By activating the R-complex in the primitive base of our brains, he can make us angry and territorial, like that wedding party in Hawaii where everyone just died. That was just a test to see if it worked, but tomorrow night it all goes global. He estimates that 5 billion of us will have killed each other inside 19 minutes with zero damage to the environment. He's taken us back to where we were in the 1800s and given us a second chance to keep things under control again. And Jack asks, so where does Mark Hamill fit into all of this? 
Why has Arnold been kidnapping all of these actors and directors? And Ambrosia answers, because he wants to make sure they survive. He loves those guys. He's been gathering them up and keeping them safe in his mountain base. They'll all be released as soon as it's over. And Jack says, of course he does. He's a 20-something nerd. Why did nobody put two and two together? Who else would you want to survive the apocalypse? Jack, he thanks Ambrosia for her help. Ambrosia asks Jack if he thinks that she's a despicable person for being with someone like James Arnold. And Jack says he doesn't think she's despicable. He thinks that she's a really good person. And that's why they targeted her to help. Jack, who has his spy glasses, asks Gary if he caught all of this conversation. Gary, wearing his spy glasses, communicates with his Uncle Jack and answers... Did you need to keep the camera on while you were having sex with her Uncle Jack? I'm as freaked out by that as the end of the world shit she was talking about. Gary, he reports into his uncle that Ridley Scott is still by the bar, but no one has shown up to talk with him. And he's starting to look kind of pissed off. Back at Jack's hotel room, he's wearing the spy glasses. And Gary is watching the feet of his uncles in real time. All of a sudden, there is a knock on the door of Jack's hotel room. Jack, he grabs his gun and goes to check the door. But just then, he gets shot in the head right through the door's peephole. And Jack dies. In the room busts in Gazelle, Dr. James Arnold, and various henchmen. Arnold says to his girlfriend Ambrosia, An old man? You're cheating on me with some 50-year-old guy? I thought we agreed that Dubai was the last time, Ambrosia. You promised me you were stopping all this shit. Arnold, he orders his guards and says, Just get her out of here. I'm too angry to speak right now. Just get her back to Olympus and we can sort this all out later. Now Gary, he's been watching this all go down through those camera spy glasses. And he runs away from the restaurant and tries to get to his Uncle Jack's hotel. Issue 6, The Conclusion Gary arrives to the hotel and he sees his Uncle Jack lying dead on the floor. Later on, Gary returns to the spy school and he is talking to other Kingsman agent Rupert Greaves and they share some whiskey and discuss Gary's dead Uncle Jack. Rupert then reveals to Gary that he is a traitor and he has been working secretly for Dr. Arnold this whole time. He's been helping Arnold recruit henchmen like Gazelle, for instance. Rupert says that he has been saving the world for 38 years, and it's a losing battle, and he believes in Dr. Arnold's plan, and he thinks that the world needs a fresh start. Rupert tries to recruit Gary to join him, they need to move fast to get to Dr. Or Arnold's hideout in the Himalayas in time before the end of the world. Gary says he's not interested. Is Rupert mental? How can he just sit back and watch five billion people die? Rupert, he pulls out a special pen and says, Don't say I didn't ask. And then he clicks it ever confidently. Gary asks, What was that? The pen. And Rupert answers, I just triggered a chemical compound laced through the whiskey. It started a chain reaction in your intestinal tract, and you'll be dead within, no, oh, 20 seconds. I'm sorry it had to end this way, but... All of a sudden, though, Rupert grows ill, and not Gary. Rupert starts foaming from the mouth, and Gary answers, I swapped the glasses. It's standard training. You've only got yourself to blame for making it second nature. Rupert then dies, and Gary, he needs to save the world, only he's not sure who he can trust. A lot of high-level people in the Kingsman Agency and world governments may be compromised, so Gary decides to start at the bottom. He goes to the dormitory where the other Kingsman Agency recruits are, the ones that he was competing against earlier and he informs them on what's going on and tells them that they have a plane to catch. 
the plane that they are catching was the one Rupert Greaves was going to use, and in it, the coordinates for Dr. James Arnold's base in the Himalayas are already programmed in, so they know where to go. Over at Dr. James Arnold's hidden base in the Himalayas, which is called Olympus, he has all sorts of celebrities and world leaders there that he is preparing for the night's events. He tells his bodyguard, Gazelle, that he is still upset that his girlfriend, Ambrosia, cheated on him. He asks, what has he done to be treated this way by her? And Gazelle tells Arnold that, well, you know, it can be a little insensitive sometimes. And Arnold, taking offense, asks, like, when? And Gazelle answers, I don't know, like, calling me Gazelle and stuff? I know you paid for all my operations, but I honestly cringe when you say it in front of people. It's making fun of a guy's disability. A lot of other guys don't like their nicknames either. Sometimes it can just be a little too much, but nobody wants to be the one to say anything. James Arnold to this says, okay. You know, this is getting a little weird. Go to the cells and supervise all these celebrities being brought in. I'm gonna go double check if they're priming the satellite properly. We see Ambrosia in her bedroom upstairs. She can't believe that she stayed with Arnold all this time, knowing what he was planning on doing, and she did nothing. She comments to herself, Jesus, all this shit because he had a little money. I must have been out of my goddamn mind. Up in the sky, Gary and the other Kingsman recruits are in a plane, on their way to Olympus to stop Arnold's plans. One of the other recruits, named Hugo, is in a hot air balloon, and he is traveling high into the upper atmosphere, almost reaching into space. He is there to try and shoot down a satellite in space with a rocket launcher, which will hopefully stop Arnold's plan from working. Gary and the others discuss their plan. Once they break into the compound, they're going to try and sabotage the in-house computer system and start freeing the celebrities who will hopefully help fight Arnold and his people back. So, Gary and his team approach the Olympus base. They see the opening to it. They are flying the plane and they bail out of it and let the plane crash inside, taking out the control center. Gary and his crew begin proceeding on foot in full-on military tactical gear. They begin shooting at Arnold's henchmen, and they start freeing various celebrities. One of the celebrities they free is Pierce Brosnan, who played James Bond in the 90s. They ask him, do you know how to fire a gun? And Pierce replies, I used to play James Bond. I've been doing this shit since before you were born. So Gary and his team continue shooting their way further into the complex. Gary eventually runs into Gazelle, and they begin fighting. Gazelle is a capable fighter, and he gains an advantage on Gary. Ambrosia, she decides to try and help Gary and the others, and do something about her boyfriend's plans. She grabs a gun and confronts her boyfriend, and says, that she is not just going to stand here and watch him kill all of these people around the world. Arnold, he turns to one of his henchmen, who happens to only have one eye and is wearing an eye patch, and he calls this henchman Cyclops, and he tells him to do something. So this Cyclops starts shooting at Ambrosia, and he hits her in her stomach. Afterwards, Cyclops tells Arnold, by the way, I wish you wouldn't keep calling me Cyclops. Gary and the Gazelle will continue fighting back and forth. Gary, he pulls out a laser pen knife though, and he uses it to slice off Gazelle's arms as well as his metal legs, and Gazelle falls to the ground. Gazelle, pretty impressed with the technology that Gary has though, asks him, shit, is that new? Gary. He then uses that laser pen knife and lasers Gazelle's brain, killing him. We see around the complex, other celebrities are now fighting back against Arnold's men. We got Pierce Brosnan here, we also got Patrick Stewart of Star Trek fame. With Gazelle gone, Gary pushes onward, 
He shoots some more henchmen, and he is now finally one-on-one -on -one against Dr. James Arnold. There is less than a minute on the countdown before the satellite will trigger the end of the world. Now, in space, the Secret Service agent trainee, Hugo, he is there to try and shoot down that satellite from his hot air balloon. Although the hot air balloon pops, it can only go up so high. So Hugo starts falling down to the Earth, and he did not get a chance to shoot down that satellite. So that one potential possibility of stopping Arnold that way is now gone. Gary talking to Arnold. Can't believe it's starting to look like Arnold is going to win. Gary says, I don't believe this. And Arnold replies, it's all for the best, trust me. I don't want to see the human race clubbing each other to death any more than you do, but I'd rather lose 5 billion people now than face total extinction a few years down the line. The countdown on the computer completes. We see around the world, all the humans everywhere look like they have been affected. Arnold believes that they will begin killing and maiming each other any minute now. Only something unexpected happens. All of the humans everywhere around the world start kissing and fornicating. Arnold can't believe it. He says, they, they should be tearing each other's throats out. What the hell is the matter with everyone? And Gary says, you're the expert, but if I had to take a guess, I'd say some clever bastard just sneaked into your computer system and reversed the frequency you were sending out. So now, instead of smashing each other's brains in, they're all being really lovely to each other. We see downstairs in Arnold's computer server room, some Kingsman agent trainees have broken into the computer system and successfully reprogrammed it. And they reply to Gary, 19 minutes of world peace, isn't it beautiful? Shame it can't last, but we'll take what we can get, eh? Around the world, we see people everywhere kissing. Arnold tells Gary, Congratulations, Mr. Super Spy. The villain has been defeated and the status quo has been resumed. But you've hardly saved the world here, I'm afraid. Don't you get it? I was your last goddamn hope! Gary, pointing a gun to Arnold, says, If you're the last hope, I'm happy to take my chances. This is for Jack London, by the way. Arnold replies, Who? Gary says, F you, and then he shoots a bullet right into Arnold's brain, making his head explode. In the aftermath of the world being saved, a funeral for Jack London is held. Gary, at home, celebrates a job well done saving the world with the other Kingsman agents. He continues his uncle's tradition and hangs up a framed newspaper headline of some other events representing the day that he saved the world and the horrible news that didn't make the day's newspaper. One of Gary's friends asks him, doesn't it bother you? All these stupid celebrities on the front page of the newspaper and nobody knowing what we did to stop James Arnold? And Gary answers, nah. Fame doesn't make you happy. Helping other people is the only thing that matters. Public service is what gives a real man value. They all cheer as their drinks and say, To Jack London, boys and girls, may he rest in peace. The final page is Gary driving to the London Kingsman headquarters in his new sports spy car, and he sees Sir Giles is there. And Sir Giles tells Gary, Ah, I was hoping you'd received my message. There was some trouble in Moscow. And that ends Kingsman, the Secret Service. Gary is now a full-fledged agent, and he will continue his uncle's work. His next mission will be taking him to Moscow. Okay, so that was Kingsman The Secret Service. The artist on this book, I should mention, was Dave Gibbons. Dave Gibbons was the artist on Watchmen, probably the greatest comic of all time. So we have an A-tier artist on this book, and I thought he did a pretty good job in this comic on the art. It looked great. Now, this book was fun. It was very fun. 
Uh, I like that we had this whole fish out of water storyline with Gary and seeing him go from this sort of poor area and now he is in this spy world and he has to survive this whole training camp and learn to be a good spy. So that was great. I liked his uncle as a character. I liked various funny bits we had throughout the book, like Mark Hamill dying early on because the parachute didn't open. Uh, the villain and his obsession with celebrities because he's a nerd and he wants to collect them all. I like that the villain was giving these offensive nicknames to some of his henchmen, Gazelle, Cyclops, and they were offended by it. So that was a pretty good bit as well. Now, one negative, I thought the final test for Gary, how he is drugged and sent to Columbia and then he has to kill these drug dealers there and come back to Britain in a certain amount of time was a little bit far-fetched and kind of ridiculous. He just has to kill tons of people, and that's his final test. So uh, I, I didn't love that particular aspect of it, but on the whole, I thought this comic was pretty good. I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10. Now, I do feel, though, that the movie, though, is so much better. They're both very similar in plot, but the movie just takes all the good things in the comic and just expands upon it. And you have the great visual flourish that you can get in a movie to really sort of uh, sell these scenes even more. So uh, as much as I do kind of like the comic, I think the movie really improves upon it and really takes it to the next level. I'd give the movie of about an 8 out of 10. So uh, yeah, great stuff here. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back in the future with Superior, more Miller books, as well as various other things. Also. No Time to Die, the newest James Bond movie is finally out, so if you haven't watched my video ranking all the Bond movies, be sure to check that out.